Thank you. Oh, bless. Yes. Wow, it's great to be here. And it's great to see Pastor Julie. Uh, we've already welcomed you, so don't go over the top. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's great, great. I... Um, as I always say when uh, I'm invited to speak on this platform, it's a great joy and delight. And yes, that's true, we've led uh, three churches. But I do believe that we, should, we are all part of the body of Christ. Yeah. And uh, we've we we're all got specific ministries. But we're all called to the general ministry. I used to say this in all my churches... You know, we might have a specific thing that we do, but we all clean the loose. We all get our hands dirty, right? And so for me and for us, for my wife and me, it's not a problem to become part of the body of Christ here and to serve. Because this is the body of Christ. We are one of, part one of another. I can't live without you. And you know what? You might not like this, but you can't live without me. <laughs> we will get on to some good news in a bit, but I just wanted to. <laughs> well, that's great. I don't, I don't know how you feel about prayer, and you hear some people praying. Um, I know in, in the Baptist tradition, there are some Baptist ministers that, my word, they can pray round the world and back. <laughs> With all the theology that comes from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> and uh, you hear some people praying, you go on the Zoom prayer meetings. And it's, by the way, if you've not been on them, they're really great. It's so good to connect and to pray for one another and pray for the mission and to go on. But, you know, you might feel a bit lost sometimes. You think... Oh, I couldn't pray like that. I couldn't do that. I remember in my first, the first church I started going to, which was an Assemblies of God church. And um, I used to hear the people praying and I think, oh, I couldn't pray like that. And one Sunday night, we always had a Sunday night meeting. The pastor said, we, we, we used to see, how many remember the redemption hymnal? Oh, my goodness me, you're older than I thought. <laughs> There's a hymn in there, the chorus goes, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. And we used to sing that chorus every Sunday night and lead into this kind of prayer. But at the end, the harmonies were great, and it was, all, it was a precious time. And, it, and it, the pastor would say, we're going to sing, I need thee, oh, I need thee, and so-and-so is going to pray. And this one night, he said, we're going to sing, I need thee, oh, I need thee. And Freddie's going to pray. I'd never prayed out loud in my life. And I'm thinking, I've got three options. Run. <laughs> Don't do it. Or just do it. <laughs> and I did it. And I just opened my mouth and prayed. And I've been doing it ever since. But you know, prayer can be difficult. It can be a big thing. But I'm going to give you the shortest prayer in the Bible. The shortest prayer in the Bible is Psalm 12 and verse 1, the first part. It says this, help Lord. <laughs> it's a good one. There's no these and downs. There's no fancy language. It's just help Lord, and God knows we need some help, don't we? And it's good to get to that place where we say, help, Lord. And I'm going to ask you to um, help me out in this time that we have together. Because the title of this message is, help is at hand. So can you say that with me? Help is at hand. Say it again. Now, if I just put my hand behind my ear and I don't say it, you're going to go. Help. Help. Wait. 
That's good. Well, that was a great sermon, and now we're just going to... No, we're not. <laughs> that prayer, help, Lord, I've used many times in great desperation. I want to tell you a couple of stories till we kick into the guts of what we want to say. It's just to make the point. I, I lived... Uh, before I moved down south and before I met Jane and she straightened me out, um, I lived a kind of a strange life. I would work sometimes and sometimes I'd be living by faith. And I, I, if I said to you, living on a shoestring, you know what I'm talking about, just living on the edge. And I didn't know half the time where the next bit of money was coming from. And I, we, I, the car I had, I used to drive, and I used to put a minimum petrol in. Can anybody identify with And you get the last few drips in there. <laughs> but I would always carry a spare gallon in the tank, in the little tank in the back of the boot. And so when I, if ever I run out, I would put the, the can in. Well, this one night in the out there in the sticks in the Worcestershire area, I was taking this old couple. I was thinking about this old couple because I'm now nearer their age, <laughs> which is not encouraging. But I was taking this old couple back home, and it was about a 10 miles back in, towards Birmingham area. And I'm driving along, and the needle is in the red. And I think, no, Lord, don't. Don't, don't, don't let it run out. Don't let it run out. Don't let it run out. And it ran out. And the car, <laughs> the car's just sort of cruising along on nothing. And uh, these couple said, everything all right? Yeah, yes, yeah, great. So we, we sort of cruised into this semi-lay-by thing. I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll go to the boot of the car. I opened it up. And I went to pick up the can, and the can was light. I'd forgotten to put some in. Help. Lord. <laughs> I mean, I'm stuck. And so the first thing I did, I, it wasn't God's fault. It wasn't the devil's fault. It's my fault. So the first thing I did said, sorry, Lord, <laughs> I repent. Now I've repented. Help. I'm done. This is a true story. And from nowhere, this guy appears. And he pulls up in his car. He said, you got a problem? And it was out of earshot of this older couple. So I just said, yeah, this is the problem. And he had a spare can. Wow. And he put that petrol in my car. And then I said, well, you know, let me give you the money. And he said, I'll have no money, thank you. Wow. Just bless somebody else. Something He didn't say bless, but just help somebody else. And I was just trying to check around the back of his shoulders to see if they were wings. <laughs> I wasn't sure. But that was one occasion where I said, help, Lord, and that help came. And then I was able to drive to the petrol station and put some petrol into the spare can and a bit more into the car. Praise God. Just help, Lord, is a good prayer. Because... Yeah, you're getting it. Okay. All right. The second time. It's not the second time in chronological order but it was as I, say, I was living on this shoestring thing and my car the cylinder head gasket had gone now I did do a crash not crash but a crash course in car mechanics not cr anyway and I and uh, so I could do the basics and I did think maybe that's what I should be doing uh, <laughs> anything <laughs> And so that I knew the cylinder head gasket had gone. I couldn't afford to pay for somebody to fix it. So, how many remember the Haynes manual? Oh. Get the, 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 for those who didn't put up their hands, it was like 
the equivalent of Google today where you just find out how to do something and somebody's gratefully uh, YouTubed and told you how to do it. It's much easier now. In those days, there was this, these manuals and Haynes covered everything, every make. So I'd got this Haynes manual and I was reading it and I tried reading it upside down, <laughs> sideways. I couldn't make head and the tail of it. Help, Lord. <laughs> this is the truth. I go to sleep. I have a dream. It, the God gave me a dream. In the dream, I saw myself fixing the cylinder head gasket. I woke up the next morning and I said, I can do that. Because... Help is at hand, you see. And the third one I just want to share briefly was when I went to Spurgeon's College. And I've shared a little bit with you that when I left school at the age of 15, I had no qualifications. Uh, I, I was almost illiterate when I left school. First book I ever read was the Bible and, and the rest is history. So when I went to Spurgeon's College, it was the first undergraduate study, serious study, I've ever done. If you've ever been to Spurgeon's College, it's an old Victorian building, high ceilings, and there was a metaphor in the high ceilings, because I felt like a grasshopper in the land of giants. I knew nothing. <laughs> and they would talk about doing, and we want you to write an exegesis on this. And I looked in my Bible and I thought, well, that comes after Genesis, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway. And I, I knew I'd got to go this route. But I said to God, if I drop my level of scores, drop down, I'm out. Because I did not want to do this. I'm not happy here. This is not what I want to do. And not once did my scores drop below. And I ended up coming out with a 2-2. Two -two. Because. <laughs> but I can tell you, many, many times I would say, I haven't got a clue. In the one lecture, I'll just say, <laughs> just say this. The one lecture, they're talking about this stuff. And I'm going, wow. I mean, I've, I've been praying, you talk about praying in tongues. I've been praying in tongues for nearly all my Christian life, praise God. And I thought, are they speaking in tongues? Is there an interpretation? <laughs> and I thought, well, well, over coffee, we're with the guys. We were, con you know, connect and we say, but no, I don't know what they talked about either. We went for coffee and they're all going, yeah, that was amazing, wasn't it? And I'm going. Help, Lord. <laughs> and he helped me. I want to say that God is our help. God is very practical. He's very personal. And he's certainly powerful. Help is at hand. I don't know about you, but I am distressed at what I see on the news. I am distressed at the distress of the Afghan people. I am distressed, not just them, but the serious suffering, and especially in the body of Christ. It touches me. It wounds me. I feel it. And I say, help, Lord. Help, Lord. You see, the body of Christ, we are not isolated from, in the West, we are not isolated from our brother's Overseas, We're not isolated from those who have made long journeys. We are members one of another. And help is at hand. Help is at hand. And I want to bring up a few Bible references just to flick through them. It's good to have the word, isn't it? And you'll see them on the screen. We can kick off with Psalm 124 and verse 8. It says, our help 
is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help, why don't we say that together? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's the place to come. He's often the last place, but that's the place to come. Isaiah 41, 10 says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Context. The people had come out of their pandemic situation. They were being brought back into the land. And they didn't know what, how we're we going to rebuild this. And God says, fear not, I will help you. God is our help. And Psalm 46, 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. I'm praying for my Afghan Christian brothers and sisters. Behind locked doors somewhere. God, be their help. Be their refuge. Be their situation. But you know, we might not be facing any of that. But we may be facing other things. But God is our help. The Hebrew writer says this. So we may confidently say. I love this. It's almost English, isn't it? That we may confidently say. The Lord is our helper. But he is. There's nowhere else to go, friends. When that petrol situation, there was nowhere else to go. And that dark night in that lane, there was nowhere else to go. He is our help. I will not fear. Because. You got to stay with it. I might just jump out and say it or do that. Help is at hand. Why don't you turn to somebody and say, help is at hand. Yeah, whatever it is you're facing, whatever your situation, whatever your circumstance, in your, situ- in your life, in your universe, help is at hand. God's help is revealed in Jesus. How lovely. The, what the theologians call Christocentric. It's a lovely word. It took me ages to work it out, but... It's, The help is revealed in Jesus. They, this isn't on the screen, but Romans 5 and 6. I didn't put it on the screen because you can't cut and paste this translation. It's a new translation. It's the upgrade of the American Standard Version. Just upgraded last year, and I'm a translation buff, right? It says, while we were still helpless, Christ died for the hunger. We don't like that, do we? That doesn't quite fit our, I can do it. But we've got to come to that place and say, I'm helpless without you, God. I can't do this. As a, as a church, as a church family, we have got to say, we can't do this without God's help. He is not the last word. He is the first word. He's the first port of call. Help, Lord. He is our help. And it's, it says we're helpless. And at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. I just love that verse because that's you and me. At the right time. When I, as an atheist, was shaking my fist at God and saying, ha, huh, The God I didn't believe in. God was still loving on me. And whatever you're facing right now. Whatever your your situation. God is on your case. Because. The Passion Translation. Part of that verse it says. We were entirely helpless. Well. Weak and powerless to save ourselves. 
that does not connect with the Western, uh, this, you know, motivational talk. Well, this is the motivation of this talk. The motivation of this talk is that we come back to God, that we get back on our knees, that we say, God, I can't do it without you. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. We translate that by saying, without you, we can't do some things. John 15, 5, it says, without me, you can do nothing. That's either true or it's not true. If it's not true, what's it in the Bible for? Without, without Jesus, we do nothing. But help was at hand, and it came in the person and the ministry of Jesus. You'll see a scripture come up on. I love this. So it's Acts 10, 38. It says, how God anointed Jesus. Watch that. He anointed Jesus. Hang on a minute. I thought he was God. Well, he is God. But God, Jesus emptied himself. That come out some of the songs. He empties himself. I believe that everything Jesus did was by the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything he did. And that teaches me two things. One, wow. That's the first one. But the second one is, that means I can. With God's help, I can do what he did. Let's, let's stop debating on what it means to do greater works and all of that. Let's just get on with it. Let's do it. Because help is at hand. He says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, with power. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. John 5, 19 says, I do nothing but what I see the Father do. And if you get that, uh, how Jesus moved in the Spirit. Everything he did. And it's, it seems as though, it, like, like the, the, the Canaan wedding and the water and the wine and all that. It looks as if he's saying, oh, don't bother me now. And then it's as if he gets a download. You see how yeah, we can connect with it. It's just like us, you see. He gets a download and the Holy Spirit seems to say, Father says through the Holy Spirit, okay, this is your time. We go for it. But just as an interest, it be inter- so many gallons of water. Did it? This is just a throw out. But did they all? Did it all those gallons become wine? If so, did they start an off license? <laughs> or did it become wine as they drew? As they poured? As they served? I know what I believe. Because how? Oh, imagine being the disciples, uh, or those servants rather, and they go to the water pots. And we've got to serve this. I, I would have been a bit nervous. I'd have been going Psalm 12, verse 1. <laughs> because if I go up to that guy over there and pass him this jug of water, he's not going to be pleased. And they, br- and they pour it, and they bring it, and it's, it's good plonk. <laughs> or, or it's a, a special wine that was not non-alcoholic for Baptists. It was pretty good, whatever it was, anyway. <laughs> it was pretty good stuff. So the disciples witnessed firsthand, not just that miracle, but the other miracles. You know, the, he, 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 the dead being raised. They witnessed the leper being touched. They witnessed all of this. Wow! Yeah. And then Jesus, but Jesus wasn't always going to be physically with them. And so he gathers them around him. He's coming up to the cross. And this is Freddie Brooks' paraphrase of John 14. Hey, guys, I'm going. <laughs> but don't worry. Help 
Is it and? <laughs> That's, you look at John 14. He's preparing them because of his death. And we know that they went through trauma and all sorts of things. And we know Peter made tons of mistakes and all of that. And of course, none of us would, would we? So when they did, they could have said, help, Lord. But help was at hand. The help is the Holy Spirit. Bring the scripture up. John 14, verses 12. We often quote this. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Hey? Yeah. Pause. They'd seen all this stuff. And greater works than these will you do. Because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name. Can I feel faith rising in this place? Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. You see, he's glorified. Do you remember when last time I spoke? It's okay to ask for more. Because God goes, great! I love it! I love Suncoast Church because they're believing for great things. Come on. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 15. If you love me, You will keep my commandments. And I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. This is why I'm using this translation. Helper. Because a helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. For he dwells with you. Come on. And he will be. In you. So let, 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 let's just, just slow down a little bit. Another, the Greek is alos, means just like me. That's why he says, let not your heart be troubled. The Holy Spirit, just like me, is, is right here. He's going to be with you. He's with you now. You've seen all this. He's with you. But he's going to be in you. This is the ministry title. Because out of your innermost being will flow what? Rivers of living water. Just like me. Jesus is the exact image of the Father. Hebrews 1, 3. He, he, he said in the earlier in the chapter, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know what the Father looks like. It looks like Jesus. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit is just like Jesus. That's why in, you find in Acts, it says, the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them go. It's not the oneness Pentecostalism, which is wrong. Sorry, guys. I am a Trinitarian, you see, okay. Believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that Trinity, the God, God is one, is Elohim, which means more than one. So the Trinity is right through the Old Testament. So I'm a Trinitarian. So it wasn't the Spirit of Jesus in the sense of, it's just Jesus. The Father, Jesus... No, it is the Holy Spirit, but it's the Spirit of Jesus. In other words, this is what Jesus would do. This is what, and Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus, prevented them from doing things just like Jesus. At the cross and the resurrection, they're told, wait until they're endured with this powerful helper. Do you remember reading those things? But if you haven't read them, just read them, go over them. If you want to talk to me, you want to message me, I'll help you. Pastor Rob, Pastor Julie, they'll help you with these things. We don't want to talk Christianese. We don't want to talk stuff that we assume you know. We don't always know. And it's okay not to know, but it's also okay to ask. Yes. Because, yes. 
Okay. So on the day of Pentecost, that became a reality. And so we see in Acts chapter 2, and it's interesting, on, on the feast of Pentecost, when it falls in our Christian calendar, you know, they wear funny hats. Don't you? Have you ever seen the bishop with the mitre? Well, it's in the shape of a flame. Did you, have you ever noticed that? It's so it, it, Well, next time you look, it's the shape of a flame, symbolizing the flame of the Holy Spirit. Come early for a seat, I tell you, there's some good stuff here. Anyway, so, and that became a reality, and the church was born, or you could say the church went boom, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because all these frightened guys, which I would have been one of them, suddenly they're endued with this power from on high, and they can do the works of Jesus. They realize that help was at hand. They can do it. They live. They went from a no can do to a can do. But it wasn't because of self-effort. It wasn't because of some motivational talk. It was because they said, help! Yeah. When we say help, God helps. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad I came, I tell you. <laughs> God's promised helper is still here. Yes. Yes. He's still here. Well, Joel 2.28 Prophecy, Peter quotes that in Acts chapter 2. Check it out. People talk about pandemic and this is the end of the world and is this it? I don't know, it might be. But I know that what the end of the world looks like, it looks like Jesus. It doesn't look like a pandemic. It doesn't look like some 666. It looks like Jesus. And so... My understanding of the timeline of the end times is that this helper, Holy Spirit, will be poured out until the end of the age. Hallelujah. That means, see I'm a classic Pentecostalist. That means that right now, right here, we can be filled with a helper. We can be filled with God's help. From the top of our head to the sole of our feet. Hallelujah. Oh dear. You see, the Holy Spirit enables us to be born again. You can't be born again without the Holy Spirit. He lives in the believer. He teaches us. Oh, I don't need to come to church because the, no man teaches me. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Every time I've come here or churches like this, I've sat there and the Holy Spirit has been teaching me through the teaching of the yeah. pulpits. That's why I always take notes. I want to keep focused. I want to hear what God is saying. He teaches the believer. He convicts. He gives power to witness. Oh, I could never witness to those 90,000 people in Eastbourne. Yes, you can. You can do it. If you say, God help me. I didn't want to speak in tongues. I didn't want to... I didn't think it was necessary. I was in a Pentecostal church and I didn't think it was necessary. I was arguing, not arguing out loud, but on the inside. You see, can we get an agreement on the inside? We did an outdoor witness and in the park and the pastor said, there was a tramp. He says, go and tell that man that God loves him. I could not. I froze and I said, God help me. I need the Holy Spirit. God changed me in that moment. And from that moment on, I started seeking God, asking God to fill me with the helper. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Until there's such time I received and I spoke with other tongues. Hallelujah. And I've been speaking in tongues ever since. Hallelujah. Because help. Whew. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. We can see the runway. We're coming. Yeah. But you see, we don't have to wait for a specific date as they did for the Feast of Pentecost. There's a reason, and this is why it's in, important to Christian friends of Israel, to understand our Jewish roots, understand what the, the, each um, season meant, Pentecost, what that meant. So there was a reason. And... 
But we don't have to wait. Although in the early days, I did go to what they Pentecostals called waiting meetings. And uh, it was in a waiting meeting that I did eventually receive. But we don't have to wait. Hallelujah. But we do have to desire. We do have to want. You know, we can't have case sera. Oh, well, God, if God wants to fill me, and God will say, I'm sorry, there's too many other hungry people. So we ask God to fill us and go on being filled because God's help is here. Let me just finish with this. And actually, fact, I am finishing, so I, maybe we could stand or whatever we're going to do in this bit. But I just, I read this the other day and I knew I was preparing for this message. But it's, it's I'm not going to go into the scripture and it's not even going to come up on the screen, but it kind of like, Something resonated here. It's in uh, 2 Kings and it's chapter 4. And uh, it's under Elisha's ministry. And this woman comes to Elisha and she says, my, my, Your servant, my husband, who was one of the prophets, has died. And they were destitute. And she said, All the money's gone. And I don't know what to do. And she's, this is her help, Lord, right? So she comes to the man of God. So he said, well, what have you got? She said, well, I've got one vessel, one container. He said, get that container and now go and borrow. Get as many containers in the house as you can. This is a great story. You read it. Second Kings chapter 4. And they poured. As you can imagine. Can you imagine that pouring and it's not emptying? It's f- and each another one. Pass another one. Pass another one. And it goes on. And then they said, Pass me one more. And they said, There's no more vessels. It says, And the oil ceased. Here's, here's my point when we see, stop being hungry. They say, this is why, why God moving there and he's not moving there. Because there aren't any vessels. I wonder in this house today, do we have some vessels? Do we have some vessels that want to be filled with God's help? Do we, uh, and okay, I, we, some of you have been filled with that help. Some of you have spoken in other tongues. But you know, there's more. There's more, there's more, there's more. There's so much more. So we're going to pray. And then I wonder, maybe somehow we can say, God, we can demonstrate our want, our desire by having prayer. Jane and I, we're happy to pray with, we'll, till whatever time. I don't know what time they shut down here, but uh, we'll pray for you. It's not about us. If there's every one of you, that's great. We'll do it some other way. In the first one, not my second church, one of my first services, I wanted to start off as I mean to go on. And I've always been a Pentebaptist, so I, I've talked about the Holy Spirit. And I said, I wonder if people want to come forward. And uh, they were standing like you are. And en masse, the whole church just went, boom. Is that you? Is that this church? Yeah. Then I invite you to come in some way. Father God, would you just, you've blessed what we've already done. And we called out for you for help. And Lord, if ever your church needed help, it is now. In these days, in these challenging times, weird times, we need your help. You've humbled us. We've come to that place where we know without you we can do nothing. But we thank you for the paracletos. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Alos, that you are just like Jesus. And that you come and that you're on the inside. And Jesus is inside us. And I ask right now on the en masse that you just fill. Let a wave of your glory fall on this place. Let the Holy Spirit fall. Show us our need. Show us our complacency. Show us 
maybe that we have never made that commitment to you. You're the Holy Spirit that does that. Show us, oh God, and come and fill your people in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, that we'll go on being filled. Go on being filled. Go on being filled. In Jesus' name. Amen.